Happy New Year, Heights Church. That was pathetic. I mean, I'm looking out at a sea of people. Let's try that again. Happy New Year, Heights Church. Yeah. This is the participation portion of the message. In case you were wondering who got to preach on New Year's Eve, this is the guy that likes you to talk to him. Now, I warned somebody yesterday that if you talk to me too much, I might call you out, Casey. Um, you never mess with the man who has the microphone. If you're online with us, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. It is truly a privilege and an honor to be with you guys. I got to kick off last year, same thing, New Year's Eve message. And um, I got to ask the question just because it, it, I, I love this time of year. How many of you absolutely had the best year of your life in 2023? Yes, good, I love it. Anybody else have like an, you guys got married. Congratulations, I saw that. Anybody else? I know somebody over here got baptized. We had a bunch of that going on. We had some people who had some amazing years. Anybody else, okay, so anybody like me who are like, can I get off this bus? <laughs> right? Like you had some stuff happen this year, right? Like you had a diagnosis that, whoa, that threw me for a loop. Or you had some news that a loved one passed away. I mean, I did. I, I had a lost sister in October. And I've been walking through this stuff. And so I, I gotta be honest, I'm ready for new. Amen. I'm ready for new. I'm ready for a new season in my life. Now that doesn't mean I'm gonna get it. It just means I'm looking forward to it. I'm hopeful for it. And, and, and I can't help it. New Year's Eve and New Year's Day always does a couple things to me. It makes me nostalgic, meaning I look back at what God has done and I look forward to what do you wanna do this year? Lord, what do you want to say to me? How many of you love New Year's resolutions? Anybody? Am I alone? Seriously? Stop it. There's like one dude, two. Okay, two. Wow. I, I got to be honest. I'm literally shocked by that. Can I tell you why? I had a conversation with somebody this morning. His name is Seth. Uh, I asked his permission to share this with you. And he said this to me. He said, hey, today, I celebrate four years clean and sober. You know what that was? It was a New Year's resolution on his part. That's why I love him so much, because sometimes, sometimes they stick. Sometimes we follow through them. Okay, so I'm going to ask the obvious question. How many of you hate them? Y'all are a bunch of liars. You can't be in the middle here. You either love them or hate them. How many of you can't stand New Year's resolutions? Put your hands up. Okay. Can I ask? I, I, I really want to ask, but I'm not going to do it. The reason, I mean, just curiosity is why? Why do we hate them so much? What's that? They're useless. I don't agree with that at all. And I've got the microphone. <laughs> You feel pressure, pressure. What happens, you know what it is? It's failure, <coughs> right? Yeah. We're afraid to fail. Yeah. If I set this New Year's resolution and I fail, oh, then I'm a failure. And it becomes part of our identity. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. We have a, a, a thing that we say around here on staff which is celebrate the failures because we're going to try stuff and some of it's going to bomb. Some of it's going to fail. And you know what? We need to celebrate those things quickly because the truth is it means we're trying something new. I'm making a, I, I'm taking a shot at something to make a shift, to make a change, to do something different in my life. I'm sorry, little man. <laughs> it's funny. Every time I pick him up, he does the same thing too. I like you. I love him. I love you guys. <laughs> but here's, here's what I know is that most of us and many of us don't like New Year's resolutions because, one, the pressure of failure. Can I tell you something? So what? So what if you fail? So what? So what if you make a goal and you don't reach the goal and you try and you try again and you try again? Maybe what happens is somewhere along the way, it sticks. 
I gotta tell you, I, I love New Year's resolutions for that reason because I've seen it happen. I have watched people like my friend Seth who are like, you know what, this is the day I'm making a change. I'm gonna do something different from this point forward. And guess what happens? They do. And he comes to me this morning and he goes, man, I got four years. That's beautiful. And I'm proud of you. And it's an honor to know you. So as I think about this stuff, I, I begin to ask the questions. I go, okay, God, what, what do you want for me moving forward? What goals and things do you want to set in my heart for the new year? Because there is some stuff. And I, Ryan might as well have preached my message I always look for a word. Lord, what's the word or the theme of the year? I've done this for years, and it's not a new thing. It's been going on a while. I've been doing it for a long time. I have let it slide the last couple years, and so I begin to ask the question, God, what what do you want from me? Like, what what goals do I have? Yes, I have some physical goals. Like, a couple years ago, I made a resolution I was going to get in the gym consistently, I have been. Now I just got to fix the food issue, which is the diet, right? Like I love food. And the problem is I know how to make everything. That's what happens when you were Chef Justin before you became Pastor Justin. And if you get a weird craving, guess what? You're like, I'm going to make that. And so you make it. And anyway, it's neither here nor there. My my point is, this is a goal that I have. I'm going to tweak some things this year because I want to be healthy and I want to live a healthy, functional life for you. Because here's here's what I want to say. We're always better together. That's our thread for today. We're always better together. And as I was praying about, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? What is it you want me to say? What do you want me to shift? What's my word for the year? I got this impression. I heard Matthew chapter 9, and I went, okay, that's new. Like, I've never had him just impress a passage on me before. It's always the word. Like, I've had discipline in the past. When I was in school and I I had to stick my nose to the grindstone and read like a crazy person. Now, if you don't know this about me, I have dyslexia. Reading's hard. It is a challenge to do it. And so I had to sit and put like noise-canceling headphones on, close the door, kick the dogs out, and focus. Like, that's my world when I read. And so other times it was tenacity. Other times it was hope. So I remember one year it was courage. I needed to step into new things. And this year I I got Matthew chapter nine and I went, huh, that's not really a word. There's probably something in the story you want me to see. So I want to read it and I want to just give you some observations that I saw in this and share with you the word. Obviously it's about togetherness, but let's read Matthew chapter nine. Jesus climbed into the boat. Now mind you, he had just got done teaching the Sermon on the Mount, like all seven chapters. He's done this. He's called about most of his disciples. He hasn't quite called Matthew yet, but he's still just kind of, this is the inaugural introduction to Jesus being a preacher. He gets in the boat, went back across the lake to his own town, and some people brought to him a paralyzed man on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, be encouraged, my child, Your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law said to themselves, that's blasphemy. Who does he, does he think he's God? Jesus knew what he was thinking. And he asked them, why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? Okay, Jesus. (laughs) So I'll prove to you that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and he said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. The man jumped to his feet and went home and fear swept the crowd as they saw what had happened. And they praised God who had given such authority to men. Some of the translations that we see, it's not the word fear, it's awestruck. They were awestruck by this moment. I have a couple observations about this passage that I wanna share with you that the kind of the key thought The first one is this, forgiveness would have been enough. Would have been enough. Isn't that why we're here? We need forgiveness. It was the very thing that we just celebrated communion, this covenant to wash us anew. It would have been enough. He'd have been happy and content with that. Mind you, 
That wasn't necessarily the reason why they brought him, but it would have been enough because we are promised something different in heaven. That's the goal. It's not here. The goal is heaven. It's always about being future-minded because there's gonna come a day, no more tears, no more pain, no more brokenness. Sin is gonna be washed away and we will be in perfection with him. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Number two, here goes Jesus reading minds again. Like, right? Like, can I be honest for a minute? I, this is just me just being real. Your sins are forgiven, my son. Who does this dude think he is? Right? Yeah. I get the Pharisees' response in this moment. Because I'm like, we don't know who Jesus is yet. We really haven't seen him do miraculous stuff. And I'm wondering, who is this guy walking around forgiven sins? You can say that until you're blue in the face. But you're not Jesus. And then he drops the bomb. Well, hey, so you know, so that you know that I have the authority to do this. <laughs> Watch this. Jesus is always pointing to the evidence in his life. Look, these miraculous things that you see Jesus do are the evidence that really was the man that he claimed to be. That's what he's saying in this passage. Which is easier, to forgive sins or miraculous healings? It's amazing to me. The word that really jumped off this page for me was their faith. Can you open that passage, the very beginning of it for me, Dale? Um, it says he, no, the very beginning. Yeah, there it is. They brought him a paralyzed man seeing their faith. I, I mean, it might as well have just jumped up and slapped me in the face, their faith. So you got four guys carrying a stretcher with a fifth guy on it. It wasn't his faith that Jesus was so impressed by. It was their faith collectively. Amen. And I, I just sat there and I went, so Lord, what are you saying to me? Like, I don't get it. What's the point? Like, this is just a picture that you're giving us of this thing that happened. And he goes, what if you were one of the dudes on the corner of the mat? Huh. I can't do it alone. I need three of my buddies to help me carry him. And I sat there with this picture and I, I began to just kind of soak in it and ask the question, what's the word, Lord? And he kept saying, their faith, their faith. It was their faith that brought him healing. And I went, is this about doing it together? Yes. Yes. It's exactly what it's about. And finally the light bulb went off and I was like, oh my gosh, the word is together. We're gonna do this together. Yes. And don't get me wrong, like I know that as a truth. Like my life group shirts say better together, duh. Like it's a thing that I've said, but it, I didn't think that it would be the theme of this year. I didn't think, I didn't expect it to be the word that God had given me that was gonna carry through the year. And so I'm like, okay, God, so what does that mean? What does together mean for this? Like, what is the thing that, that you're challenging me to with it? Because I don't wanna just sit here and, and wonder. <laughs> As I was prepping for this message, I came across the Surgeon General study from May. Has anybody seen this? Like, have you seen this thing? It's crazy. So I wanna share a couple thoughts. It says this, the, the Surgeon General back in May dropped a report and a study about being alone in this world and what it does. Physical health consequences for poor or insufficient connection include a 29% increased risk of heart disease. That's like 30% if you're by yourself for having a heart attack. A 32% increase of a stroke. <laughs> How about this one? A 50% increase and the risk of developing dementia or for older adults. 50%. I wouldn't bet on those odds. Additionally, the lack of social connection increases the risk of premature death by 60%. It's huge. We were made for connection with one another. 
I know we know this. I mean, like, I'm not telling you anything. You're like, ooh, this is so surprising, Justin. Like, it's not a shock to you guys. You know this. It just surprises me that, like, as I, I was sitting there thinking this, like, I need to double down on this. It's not just a thing I need to know. It's a thing I need to lean in and live into because I need to, for lack of a better term, I need to drag as many people on a mat as humanly possible. And I need four corners tacked with guys carrying the stinking mats with me because that's how we're going to do it at Heights Church. It can't be just us on the pastoral team. I need you guys bringing your friends. We need, we, we need people grabbing the corners of mats saying, look, you just need, I just need to get you to Jesus. I need to get you near him because when you get near him, something changes. I need to get you to church to just see what this is about because I tell you, people walk in here and this is what they say to us all the time. Why do I cry when I come to church? Like, what's that about? Like, I get really emotional. I'm not looking at you, I swear. (laughs) Here's why. When you enter the goodness and the presence of God, his love for you and his acceptance of you, knowing all of the junk you've ever done, is overwhelming. And it brings us to tears. And it's beautiful. And it brings healing because he says to you, hey, your sins are forgiven. And it's enough. And it's enough. As you continue to read that report from the Surgeon General, their advice, woo, I, I literally laughed out loud when I read their advice. Because it's so dumb, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it like that's dumb. <laughs> Uh, It's just dumb. Oh, we need better interaction on social media. I'm like, oh, okay. Good luck with that one, Scooter. (laughs) Seriously, I was laughing. Because the truth is, without Jesus, it won't change. It just won't change. We need each other. We need to cultivate these intimate... And I know, guys, I just used the word, the I word, the intimacy. And dudes are like, Woo. yeah, okay. All right, we need to develop really healthy bros. Can I say that? Is that acceptable for you dudes? Like, I need the kind of brothers in my life that I can just be honest and be myself with. That I don't have to worry about the failures, the shortcomings. Because you know what? Those aren't my identity. The fact that I'm loved by Jesus is my identity, and so is it for you. That's it. But we need to connect those friendships so that we can be honest when we're struggling. Because without the honesty of the struggle, guess what? I'll still struggle in silence. I'll struggle alone. But if I have a friend that I can confide in who is trustworthy enough to not share it with everyone else under the sun and yet love me just as I am in the hot mess that I am, it really shows you what grace is. Because I guarantee you, if Seth had come to me four years ago and said, hey, I I need to get sober, and I went, whatever, dude, you've tried this before. Like, how discouraging would that have been? I I mean, I don't want to nail and and drive those things. You don't want to discourage folks who are literally trying to make changes in their life. We need to be the kind of people that just love and accept and bring you close because as I bring you close and I train you how to follow Jesus, he will transform you. It's not up to me. It's not up to me. It's up to him. And so how do we get people close, including myself? Because if I'm not close, again, it was their faith. It wasn't just, hey, we're gonna bring this guy and drop him off, have a nice day. Thanks. Thanks, Jesus. You're awesome. It was their faith. I'm going to do a shameless plug because I can. <laughs> um, life group signups for next week. Yeah, man. Sign up. Yeah. Sign up. If you're not in a group, man, get in a group. We've got them for you. If you're in a group, praise God, you're in a group. Take some of your group buddies out for coffee. Get together, build those friendships because I'll be honest, healthy friendships, they take time. Because you have to build the trust, right? I can't just vomit my life on somebody and expect them to go, hey, we're good. Because, because come on. 
Have you ever had somebody overshare the first time they hung out with you? Whoa. I love you. I'm going to be praying for all of that. Because I don't know what to do with it. But it does. It takes time. But we still need to be loving to those folks who are struggling that way. Because here's the thing. The church is like a hospital. Can I compare this to a hospital for a moment? Yes. The truth is every single one of us comes in here with varying degrees of brokenness. Amen. Every single one of us. Some of us are nurses. And by that, I mean there's only one doctor and it sure as heck isn't me. And it's not Pastor Craig either. It's not Pastor Tim. We're just nurses in this thing. We're just bringing you to the physician, which is Jesus. Amen. Amen. So that means that some of us are in process of helping people get well and some of us are getting well ourselves and some of us are both. Because the truth is we are, right? I'm carrying the mat along with my brother to get them near Jesus to find health and freedom. Years ago when I like first became a Christian, so I'm October, it was probably, October, probably early November. um, I had no, I was brand new to faith, maybe two weeks old. I was a baby Christian. I have no idea how I knew to pray the prayer, to surrender my, I don't know, but I know that when I did on October 7th of 93, he entered my life because it changed. Like everything changed. It was wild. And I didn't have a home church. I didn't have anybody to mentor me. I was all alone in Sacramento. I had no friends. And I did what I thought Christians do. You ready for this? I said, okay, God, I got my Bible out. You need to tell me what to do with my life. Right? And I just opened it up. Because isn't that what you do? Like, I didn't know. I had nobody to show me the way. I had no one to demonstrate it to me. And his ridiculous kindness to me, he dropped this nugget on me. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. It's the last words that Jesus gives to his disciples. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you to, and remember that I am with you always to the very end of the age. You can leave that up for for now. Make, no, no, go back. Make (laughs) disciples. Make disciples. I was like, cool. How do I do that? Right? It's a fair question. You're like, that seems like a really big job. I don't know how to do that. I was a host at the IHOP that's now Gangnam Mongolian Barbecue. You guys remember back when that was an IHOP there? Like one person does? Great. Awesome. (laughs) So I was the host there. Again, I was like 18. And this dude comes walking through, and I've been shy my whole life. (laughs) You're you're, you're lying, Justin. (laughs) It's true. Um, this guy's talking to his, this other person about Jesus. And I said to him, I was like, hey, are you a Christian? And he goes, yeah, are you? And I said, yeah. He goes, well, how'd you become one? And I went, I asked Jesus to forgive me of sins and to come into my life. And he sticks out his hand and he goes, welcome to the family of God. And he goes, hey, I got this Bible study over here at Sun River. You should come and join us. Okay, thanks. Have a great day. Wednesday night, I show up. Guess what it was about? It was discipleship 101. (laughs) Maybe this Jesus thing is real. I literally have goosebumps right now. Just remembering how faithful God was in that moment for me. And I I since then met met a man who was a mentor of mine. His name is Leonard. And he began training me and teaching me one-on-one. And he spent time with me over coffee talking just about faith. What does it mean? How do we do this? And a couple years ago, he gave me some language because I... I, again, I'm wanting to make disciples and here's a guy who's done it for me, but it feels so organic. Like how do you train somebody in like this weird amoeba thing, right? Because it feels so big, doesn't it? You're like, there's all this stuff to that. And, and, and it, you know, a lot of churches will try and jam it into classes and we'll say, okay, we've got to go to 101 and 201 and 301 and 401 and then you got to do this class and this class and this class. And here's the truth is, Yes, there's some, there's some strategy to it, but Jesus, Jesus discipled his men and these 12 along the way. 
When you read the gospels, you see him at a vineyard going, hey, you know, the kingdom of heaven's like this. I mean, let me teach you about this. Hey, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And he constantly was using the practical that they were in to teach and to train them. That's how he did it. But if you read it, you'll see there's strategy to it. And I wanna share that strategy with you really quickly. It's, it's these five things, follow, trust, love, imitate, and bear fruit. Following is always about our eyes, our ears, and our attention. I can't follow you if I'm not looking at you. If I'm not listening to what you have to say, I can't do the things you're telling me to do. I need to give you my attention. That's the first one. So he, Leonard taught me how to follow. That's the first thing we need to do as we're making disciples, including my own life, because it's the first question I need to ask myself. How am I doing? Am I following? Am I giving Jesus my attention or am I giving something else my attention? Because if I'm giving something else my attention, I may not be following the thing that I want to follow as closely. The second one is trust. And it's, they're, they're so interconnected with one another because as I follow and as I give my eyes and my ears and my attention to Jesus, I begin to learn that he's trustworthy. Like, like early on when I, when I prayed, what do you want me to do? And he gives me this thing and then he drops it on my lap and gives me these mentors to show me how to do it. He was being faithful and I learned that I could trust him. And it's a choice that I have to make. Trust is about my mind and my mind renewal because as I'm following, and the way that we follow Jesus today is we get into the word. We get into the word. That's where we learn about him. And as I, I'm learning about him, I'm learning that I can trust him because that's what he does. And then the next one is love. I experience his love. Now, mind you, these things are closely connected. It happens usually really fast. And it's a cycle that we continue over and over and over throughout our faith because there's always more that I can follow with. There's always a deeper level of trust that I can grow into. And more than that, there's always, I can always know his love greater and greater and greater. And as I learn about his love for me, it flows to other people because that's what God's love does. Amen. You can't Amen. help it. If you really receive the love of God, it just goes because that's what it's designed to do. It's love God and love others. And as we walk with him, we begin to do the, really, we begin to imitate him. We get to do the things that Jesus did. We invite people into the process. We love them. We encourage them. We laugh with them. We cry with them. Amen. We grieve with them. We celebrate with them. We celebrate four years with them. Imitation is about doing the things that Jesus does and it's about obedience. The last one is this, it's about bearing fruit. Now, I used to think that bearing fruit was love, peace, patience, joy, kindness, goodness, all that stuff. It is, but that's the fruit of the spirit. That's what happens in the following. That's what happens in the imitation. That's what happens in the connection of trust and love. Bearing fruit is the dude on the mat. Amen. I am bringing Jesus, people to Jesus and he's constantly telling us the harvest is right. The harvest is plentiful. He's not talking about spiritual fruit. He's talking about people. Always. He's saying, look, the harvest is right, meaning I want you to bring people to me and train them. I want you to make disciples out of them. So many times we disconnect evangelism from discipleship. And I want to tell you, I want to encourage you, bring them back together because that's not the point. Inv inviting people to come and see what Jesus has it's just in the invitation to make a disciple. I, 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 here's the thing. My goal isn't to hit a home run with somebody and lead you far away from God to repentance right then and there. You know what my goal is with people that, I, that don't know Jesus? is just to get you one step closer to him. Do you know what my goal is with people who follow Jesus? It's not to make you like a pastor. I just want to get you one step closer to him. That's it. Because as we do that, as, I, as we walk this life together, and as you pursue him, he will draw you in and he will transform you. Amen. Amen. To do this, we need to follow his word, right? Yes, yes. That's what it really needs to be about. So 
I have an invitation for you, Heights Church. For the last four years, I've done this, and it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and this year, my goal is to max it out. I want to blow it out. Like, I have read the Bible cover to cover with people for the last four years. This will be year five. So my invitation to you, if you look in your planner or in your hot sheet or in your notes, it's in your notes specifically, there's an invitation. version has a Bible app plan. I'm gonna invite you to do this. I want you to go to the app store if you don't have version One, it's free. It's the best Bible app out there. It's awesome. It's amazing. I absolutely love it. If you're not my friend, you go find, you search Justin Orr and you find me and this is gonna be the picture. Best day at Disneyland ever, by the way. Hands down, phenomenal. That's what you're looking for. You find this picture of me, you go, add friend. You can go back to the directions again. Once you add me as a friend, I will send you an invite to read the Bible with me for the year. 365 days. And I know some of you are thinking, man, that is a lot. Justin, that is a big ask. Yes, it is. You know what? It's okay. Let me tell you, if you join me and you don't make it, that's okay. Ask anyone who's done it with me. They'll never go, Justin is so mean. Oh my gosh. He's so, such a slave driver when it comes to reading the Bible. No, I'm not. Because the truth is, I just want you to get one step closer to him. And I'm going to do it with others. I'm going to double down on doing this together. I, I can have 150 people reading the Bible with me. I have sent 87 invitations out. I have space. Join me. Now, if, if you don't make it, okay. We believe in grace. But maybe you read more than you ever have. Can I tell you something? Last year I had about half a dozen people who had never read the Bible cover to cover who have now read the Bible cover to cover. Right? Praise God for that. Like that's a win. That's a huge win for, for just us and for them. I'm excited about that for them. Like, I love that. I, I, look, here's the other thing I want to be honest. I listen to it. That's the beauty of the YouVersion app. You can push play and it will read it to you. And if you're like me and you like to listen at a higher pace and you want Alvin and the Chipmunks reading the Bible to you, you can. You can speed him up because he reads slow. And my mind goes faster than that. Speed up. My alarm goes off at 5.15 in the morning. I get, I know, somebody, ugh. <laughs> I get up, I get dressed, I jump in my car, I open my Bible app, and I push play. And I drive to the gym listening to my Bible. And if I don't finish it, I get done with my workout, dying, I come back to the car, I push play, and I finish it on my way home. It's, it's the idea of habit stacking. You need to take one thing that you do all the time and you need to put this right on top of it, and it will make you successful. You know when my wife reads it? When she's getting ready in the morning? You know how I annoy her? I talk to her. <laughs> I love you, babe. <laughs> she'll have her AirPods in. I can see it reading the Bible to her, and I'm like, hey, hey. But that's my encouragement to you. Join me. The directions are in your planner. Find it. If you send me a friend request, you'll get an automatic invite. I will just immediately turn around and invite. The other thing is, you have to accept it. You have to accept the invitation to read it. So that's part of it. But please join me in this because to do this together, I want to read the Bible together. If we're really going to follow Jesus and give him our eyes and our ears, we've got to do it together. Here's my challenge for you guys, church. Do it with me, please. And if you say no, I'm, I'm okay with that. Like, if you have other plans, like, I have people who are like, dude, I read, like, 14, cool, I don't care. As long as you're in the word. Can I tell you, here, here's, here's my concern, church. I have friends who have said this to me. Hey, I listen to so-and-so, and I listen to this podcast, and I listen to this, and I listen to that. I'm like, when do, you, when do you listen to the Bible, or when do you read your Bible? Well, yeah, but I listen to so-and-so who's this preacher, and they do this great stuff, and they teach these great things. You're right. You know how the Bereans knew? They checked. The only way you check is by reading. I want you guys to be so stable in your knowledge of the word of God that when you hear nonsense, you go, man, that doesn't, I, I've never read that. that doesn't, that's not right. 
It's not right. When I was chef Justin, um, I would put my headphones, this is back when iPods were a thing, before phones had everything. Put my iPod in there, and again, I couldn't speed this guy up, unfortunately. And I would just listen from Genesis to Revelations. And I'd start again, and I'd listen for three hours, and it was just background noise. But I did it for three and a half years. Every day I was at work, I listened to my Bible, I listened to my Bible, I listened to my Bible, and guess what happened? Unknowingly, I began to memorize large chunks of it. And so someone said, would say, oh, it's out of this book. And I'm like, no, that's not in there. It doesn't say that. Because I know. And it's not because I'm trying to brag, but because I just love the word. And I know the only way I'm going to know Jesus is by reading the gospels of Jesus. I got to read his word. Number two is this. <clears throat> Who's mad are you carrying this year? I know that you have somebody in your mind that you're thinking, man, that person needs to get here to get close to Jesus. Pray for him. We underestimate what God will do when we pray hard for people. We do. Don't underestimate that. God has something they want to do and people are hungry and they're lonely. And loneliness is killing us. Last one is this. What New Year's resolution are you going to make? What are you going to do? Do something different. Take a stab at it. It's okay to fail. It's not your identity. You know, like, you, you ever watch somebody start playing a musical instrument for the first time? They suck. <laughs> I, and I don't mean judgment. It's just true. You're not good at it. That's Okay. We don't, we don't look at our kids when they're learning to walk and go, how come you're not running marathons yet? <laughs> we, don't, we don't do that. And yet, somewhere along the way, we believe the lie of the enemy that failure is somehow a measure of us as people. That is not true. The only way to get better is try something new and grow. That's literally it. Yeah. So do it. Step out into it. Maybe next year when I come up and I ask that question, who loves New Year's resolutions? More hands will go up. Because, guess what? Maybe it'll stick. It might. You don't know. That's my hope. The last one is this. Is let's dive into the Word. And let's make this a year where the Word permeates our lives. I was, I was reading a post. I think it was Heights Church that threw one on to Instagram. And Pastor Jennifer said, I want to get closer to Jesus this year. I want that to be all of our goal for 2024. Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you that you want and you made us to do life together. Father, I pray for Heights Church that you would just do something beautiful in their hearts and minds. That you would help them take a step in the direction of you, that you would help them to lean into the word this year. God, if there's somebody out here who's never done any of these things, and yet they felt the need to try something new walking into this year, Lord, I just pray that they would go have a conversation with you. That they'd surrender their hearts. Father, I just pray for your spirit to just bless this church because you are the physician and you want to heal the broken. Amen. God, may we grab mats and may we find brothers and sisters and grow deeper in our friendships together and double down on the idea of being better together. Amen. That our lives would be transformed, that we would find greater hope and courage when we have to face the hard because, Lord, this world doesn't seem to be getting prettier but uglier. Lord, more and more, we need one another and we need you in the midst of that so that we have the power and the grace to love in the face of anger. Amen. Amen. And to love in the face of brokenness. So Father, we just pray and we thank you for the ending of a one season and the beginning of a new. Will you bless us and help us step into it with great courage and faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Giving is one of the greatest joys that you and I can experience in life. And I love how we are promised in scripture in the book of Luke, that our gift will return to us in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. It actually says running over. And that's the awesome reason why you can step into giving here at Heights Church. And by supporting Heights Church, you and I have the privilege of stepping into the miraculous work that God is doing in the lives of others. I mean, when we think about it, God is our great provider. He has given us everything that we need. And we get to give a portion of that back so that miraculous work will continue in the lives of others. By giving to support Heights Church, you are actually helping to provide many wonderful opportunities, such as creating a safe place for our kids to learn about Jesus. Yes, and bringing students a sense of purpose and belonging through all of our student ministries that we offer here at Heights Church. We get to see people's spirits lifted higher as they engage in our Sunday worship mm -hmm. service, either at part of our online campus or here in person. Mm -hmm. We're actually watching God's word come alive as we learn about its meaning for us today in our Sunday messages. And also we get to open doors for meaningful connections and friendships through our life groups. And we're touching lives overwhelmed by fear, by grief, by addiction and hopelessness, and we are helping to transform them and helping people to experience peace, hope, and joy through the Restoration Ministries. You and I can leave a legacy literally for eternity as, as we see lives changed forever through the church. Will you pray about what God would have you give today? I know that he wants to bring the joy of giving into your life and see lives transformed through you.